Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Hood. I'm your host, Jimmy Rashid. And uh, happy to say I have with me again Sheikh Mohammed Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for being with us again. Okay, let me just remind you of our telephone number. The country code is 202, then it's 8555 248. And 249. And again, just a reminder about the email, please do withhold your emails. We have in a backlog of over several hundred emails, and all those people that have emailed and, and asked us to, to keep going with the email, we're going to try to make a few special programs just to deal with your email questions. So please do be patient with us. Sheikh, uh, before I go to one of the questions from the emails, um, last week we had Brother uh, Abdul Hamid of the last episode, and he was speaking about bringing up children, how to go about uh, educating them. Um, we didn't really finish off with that, so if you could carry on and just clarify some of your questions regarding this issue, Sheikh. A'udhu billahi samiyya al-alimi min ash-shaytan al-rajim min hamzihi wa nafkhihi wa nafsih. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise be to Allah. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad peace be upon him is his last messenger. Since uh, last episode I have received an enormous amount of phone calls following up on brother Abdul Hamid from Australia uh, to his complaint and his concern. So many people got my number and they were contacting me concerning the same problem that they have made hijrah, they left the west they uh, moved to some Muslim countries, not necessarily the same place, but so many of them shared with Brother Abdul Hamid the same story. And their complaint was that when they moved, they did not find the safe heaven that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And it is very obvious that uh, many of uh, the Muslim brothers and sisters who are very keen to keep Islam life in their daily life, thought by moving to a Muslim country they would live amongst the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would get to see people like Mus'ab and uh, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and uh, the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but I have to tell you uh, the fact is totally different uh, people are normal people like everybody else and societies vary from a society to another but we have to look uh, into the bright side of your case which is at least now your kids don't have to go to schools where boys and girls are mixed girls are almost have naked or completely naked uh, your kids at the schools won't have to go through sexual education classes won't have to go through an illegal relationship between the opposite genders or even the same gender because of the peer pressure in, in the Muslim societies, particularly most of those who have called me, I can claim, and I'm so definite that uh, these uh, places and these schools are drug-free zones, which is not affordable and you cannot find in, in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure that, that no counselor is going to call you concerning your son or daughter and say that, well, your son has been experiencing some trouble because till now he could not find a girlfriend nor would call you concerning your daughter and say that your daughter is already 12 and she does not have a boyfriend. That happens in the West as we've all lived there and we're very familiar with that. Uh, I, I couldn't accept that my son attending a class to learn about sexual uh, relations and the right of uh, the person to have a relationship with the same gender simply because he was born like that. So in a Muslim society, you would not find any of that by the praise of Allah. Your expectations have to be uh, according to the reality of the world which we are living in. The world now is a small village. But we look into this case according to the rule of the benefit-risk ratio. Mm -hmm. Are there gains that you've gained be, uh, through moving to a Muslim society? Absolutely. Well, you would like to change this Muslim society to be an ideal society similar to what you've read in books about the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then you too have to play a role in that. I have also advised many of those who have called me that it is very essential and important to send your kids to schools. Uh, most of their claims that they could not find a good Muslim uh, school so that they could trust them with uh, putting their kids uh, in these schools. And I'm very, very surprised to hear that. That's why I promised them and now I'm trying to fulfill my vow which is I'm calling upon the principals, the administrators, the owners of the Muslim 
schools uh, which adopt Islamic curriculums who do believe in themselves that they are providing good service for Islam and Muslims and a good environment for the Muslim students and their parents <laughs> as well to come forward and to contact us and we'll be very happy to host your advertisement and even inform the viewers about uh, your schools because I am so surprised and I would like to share my surprise with the viewers that uh, these people when they move to Muslim countries they could not find a Muslim school which they could trust to deposit their children there. Then after that do not forget the role which is laid upon your shoulders. I always say that the school is just uh, a place could provide some education for your children but the proper education and the most perfect one will be provided from home. So if they learn reading the Quran and studying some hadith and so on in the school that is fine but to uh, generate a generation of scholars of Sharia of Fiqh in addition to being a psychiatrist uh, a doctor, an MD, an engineer, then you have to work on that at home, even by recruiting some private tutors who teach your kids the Quran, make them memorize the entire Quran or as much as you can, and also educate them about the hadith of Rasulullah and the fiqh and so on. I'm very impressed with many of the phone calls that the parents, even though they were reverts, are very keen to keep their children in, in a good environment. So I pray for them and I keep praying for them. May Allah bless you and Amen. increase your steadfastness and keenness to practice Islam and to be righteous Muslims. And I can assure you that Allah the Almighty will never abandon you. Those who left the comfort of home, the pleasure and the luxury of living in a very fancy, easy society, to move to a hot place, a much lesser luxury than what they had, it was all done for the sake of Allah, and Allah would not waste the reward of your actions. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we've got the first call of the day, Um Salam, from the United Arab Emirates. Sister, your life on Ask Khuda, your question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have a question. My, one of my sisters, she is in a non Muslim country. And she's very keen in uh, doing her hijrah, but uh, circumstances are not permitting her. She has two daughters. One daughter is in, uh, both her daughters in college. One timing of uh, college is such that she has to pay her dohar and asar together. And I said, this is not right. But I want you to advise, uh, I mean, her timing is such she has explained that she cannot pray the circumstances around where she's living is so congested that uh, she cannot pray her uh, asar, so she prays her dohar and asar together. Mm -hmm. I felt that this was not right, so what, what is your advice? And she comes home after Maghrib, home, and this is her college, one year, this will be for one year. I said, this is too long a time to postpone or to mix around with the salah. Can you give some advice on this point? Sorry, no. Secondly, uh, uh, I want you to pray for her that she, she is very keen in doing hijrah, but I want you to pray and all, all the viewers, everybody for her that Allah make her hijrah easy. Right. Secondly, I want to know uh, if some people are under the spell of hypnotism. Hypnotism. People are hypnotizing and making them do things which unwillingly they are doing. Yeah. How can they come out? Some people are using certain things like clothes, hair and uh, even photographs mm -hmm. to hypnotize or do things. Mm -hmm. and make, make people do things without their will. Mm -hmm. Please give some advice. Though, okay. Alhamdulillah, yeah. whatever I'm l learning from Huda TV and what knowledge I have, I'm passing on to people. Exactly. But it's no not more. sufficient. I think I need more knowledge to, because many people are being misled on this point. Okay. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Uh, sister Um Salam there from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have uh, Tan online from Jordan. You're live on Ask Huda. Your question, please. Hello? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sheikh, I want to ask you, know, I send many mails to, to your program, but I miss many episodes, so I want to ask again. Okay. You know, our young you know, want to go to Umrah, a group of women, just. Yes. 
I think we may have lost uh, Sister Tan there. Okay, I got the gist of the question, so I'll I'll write that down. Okay, Sheikh. Um, if you can take uh, Om Salam's question, Sheikh. Um, one of her sisters is living in a non-Muslim country. She wants to make Hijra. She has a daughter who's in college. Uh, this daughter, due to circumstances, whether it's class or the travelling, she joins Asr uh, and the Dhuhr Salah, and she gets home after Maghrib. Um, She's saying, now what should, should I advise her? Should I really advise her to make this Salah separate? Or is she allowed to do what she's doing, Sheikh? Uh, well, this is exactly what I expected. I expected to uh, hear an echo for the previous question because many, many Muslims are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you and us uh, are of them. So mm -hmm. may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate for everyone whatever they carry of good intention to be able to execute their plans. Amen. Amen. Uh, as long as she's staying there, whether in a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society, uh, offering the salah on time, there is no excuse that could waive this command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا To be offered on fixed times. As long as the person is resident, not traveling, healthy and not sick, he is not allowed to postpone the salah and delay it or combine two different prayers, except in certain conditions as we mentioned earlier. As far as a student who is studying at a university and does not have a place to offer the salah and she would have to combine them, I really uh, see it uh, the other way around. Because in every university that I visited there is a chapel. But this is not for Muslims. I say, and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have been given five qualities. No prophet before me has been given any of them. One of them is, وَجُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا فَأَيُّ مَا مْرِئٍ مِّنْ أُمَّتِي أَدْرَكَتْهُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيُصَلِّي The entire earth has been made lawful for me as a place of offering the prayer and seeking purification. In case of absence of water, then we tend to do tayammum with the dust. So if anyone, any member of my ummah happens to witness a prayer time, then let him pray. The salah is not limited to a certain place. As long as the place is tahir, then go ahead and face the qibla and offer the prayer. So I believe it is accessible in the West for those who are working in a hospital, mm -hmm. working at a university or at any business to find a place where they could offer their prayer and I believe that the local people would definitely respect that. Any prayer would not take more than 10 minutes at max. So be very keen to offer the prayer in time and Allah the Almighty will make it easy for you to do so. Especially if you have colleagues and you try to make a union, in this case you'll be able to find or take a room, the administration would uh, appoint or assign a place for you where you can offer the prayer. Not only that, we managed in many schools, mm. whether high schools, or universities, to designate places for Salatul Jumu'ah as well where they invite a speaker where they can offer Salatul Jumu'ah. Muslims have to be proactive, not passive. You should not just wait, sit and wait and say, well, right. I cannot do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in, in, in North America, there is MSA and Muslim Student Associations and other organizations which are very, very active, not only in organizing uh, uh, Muslim activities and offering the prayer on time and Jama'ah and Jumu'ah, but also inviting speakers from others and the universities welcome that as long as it is with uh, moderate fashion. So I, uh, I once again reiterate what I said that. Offering the prayer on time is a must as long as you're resident, whether you're studying, whether you're teaching, whether you're working at a hospital, as long as there is no valid excuse. Jazakallah <laughs> Sheikh. Okay, we have uh, Brother Abdul Wafi from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live and ask her your question, please. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum As Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. As Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum As Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Sir, I'm calling from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, in Saudi Arabia, in international schools, most of the students never taught Quran and Hadith in a regular way. Yeah. And the second question is, most of the teachers, female teachers, wear the Christian dress in the school, and the most of the students of higher standards will follow the same thing. Yeah. And when the students come outside, most of the students out of the school, they smoke. Mm -hmm. And they mingle with the uh, student in such a way, so it has been to be prohibited. Okay. Yeah. 
So can you have an advice for us? Okay, okay. Jazakallah but Okay, we have uh, Sister Wafa with us from Egypt. Sister, you're live on Ask Her Your Question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. for everything. Wa jazakum. Uh, please, Jaha, I have a question. Uh, I hear that uh, hadith for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, which means every speech of the son of Adam is um, against him, except for commanding good and forbidding evil or the remembrance of Allah. This is really uh, scared me because the majority of our speech is out of that. What about uh, talking about uh, bloody political issues, um, TV shows, or even fashion or perfumes, and so on? Or is this thing is forced to talk about? That Can you get that, Sheikh? Okay. Okay. Barakallah yes, Sister Wafa there from Egypt. Okay, Sheikh, if I could uh, go back to the question, uh, the second question from Sister Um Salam from the United Arab Emirates. Um, she says that some people get hypnotized, they do things which they don't want to do, and she, she quoted some things, I think it's very close to Sihr, to magic. Um, how does somebody get themselves to this problem, Sheikh? Well, uh, she also mentioned that this is not due to jinn, and I want to confirm that people who use this uh, hypnotizing method or cast magical spell is actually utilizing the jinn, mm -hmm. the kafir jinn, mm -hmm. and they too turn to be disbelievers and kafirs. So the first warning I would like to issue here is, visiting such people to either cast a magical spell on another person, even a mean of revenge or whatever, mm. is an act of kufr, an act of disbelief. The Prophet ﷺ said so. Second, seeking help from such people by claiming that they have the power of utilizing the jinn and there is really nothing could help but utilizing the jinn to be able to overpower the act or the magical spell which has been cast on an individual by another jinn is also an act of kufr. As far as the people who do this process are definitely disbelievers and uh, they were judged as to be killed in, in a Muslim society, of course they've been caught. So I would like to issue these warnings at first. Second, how the Prophet ﷺ treated and handled this? By the permissible uh, legal ruqya, al ruqya to sharia, mm -hmm. which is available in books in the fortress of the Muslim and on CDs, on DVDs, on tapes, that it has to be recited by a righteous person. By the meaning, some people just play a CD or an audio tape and they listen to it and they think that would be effective. This is not true. You either recite it yourself by yourself, then blow twice as we prescribed before, or you have a righteous person who would recite it upon you because it is the influence and the effect of the piety of the person who is reciting so. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, used to give ruqya by reciting simply Surah Al-Fatiha, a surah which every Muslim uh, must memorize, very simple. Many people tend to collect verses from all over the Qur'an and make it very complicated, while Umar ibn al-Khattab used to recite just Surah Al-Fatiha. So some people said, so how come that we've been reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and it's not working with us? The answer is, look who's reciting, who is reciting. So it is required to have the person who's providing or giving the ruqya have righteousness. It's not doing this as a mean of business, because sometimes if it works with an individual, they tend to open their own business of a given ruqya. So reciting Al-Mu'awizat, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ قُلْ عَوْضُ رَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ عَوْضُ رَبِّ النَّاسِ Ayatul Kursi, and especially at night, shall provide you with the inner protection, keeping trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, performing wudu all time. This is a very important advice I would like to give to those who are suffering from any either magical spell, evil eye, or whatever. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us that there is nothing could extinguish fire better than water. And a shaitan is created from fire. So tend to make wudu right away that would definitely keep a shaitan away from you. A shaitan would not get closer to a person who is always in a state of tahara. So this is another advice. If you recite Surah Al-Baqarah regularly, this is very, very effective mean of defending yourself and protecting yourself and family. Your entire household against a shaitan. As was mentioned in some hadith, its effect would last for three days. So recite Surah Al-Baqarah, recite Surah Yasin, recite Ayatul Kursi, recite the Mu'awadhat which you've mentioned before. And before you go to sleep, also recite the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whosoever recites them, kafata. This should suffice mm. him as a mean of protection. Jazakallah khair, Okay, we've got uh, Brother Muntasir 
from Egypt, brother. You're live on Askaru. Your question, please. Oh, I think we've lost brother Muntasir. If you do call back in, brother, we'll try to get you back on straight away. Okay, Sheikh. Um, I've got a question here from Sister Tan from Jordan. She said she sent some emails and she didn't get the reply, so she's given the question. And just a, a brief note, sometimes when we do get the emails, we get so many emails with the same question. So what we do do is we do answer the questions live on the program. Some people do miss it. Uh, just because we don't mention a name, we're actually answering your questions. So please uh, be attentive. I know it's difficult, but please bear with us. There uh, is another thing, which mm. is... I uh, personally receive uh, so many emails mm -hmm. and we tend to answer some of them in, uh, in the live shows. In addition to if we have a duplicate or a question that's been asked so many times, we that's don't right. have to specify this question is from such and such or so and so. If the answer has been delivered, that should be sufficient. And it's really difficult to uh, satisfy the need of every individual, but we will try our best, our best, inshallah, and just pray for us that may Allah help us to do so. Jazakallah for that clarification, Sheikh. Okay, the question uh, was going to Umrah as, as a group of women, no. women without a mahram. Is this allowed, Sheikh? Uh, the purpose of performing Umrah or Hajj is to do what? Is to earn the reward. Is to have your previous sins being forgiven. So it is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Well, Allah the Almighty said it's not permissible for a woman to travel alone without a male mahram of her own. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the recent scholars said, well, it's okay if it is in a safe and secure company. That, of course, is missing uh, a reference. It doesn't have a support. And that's why I'm still of the view that it is not permissible for a woman to travel with a male mahram even if she is performing hajj or umrah and Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair Okay, we have Sister Najah from Nigeria. Sister, you're live and ask her your question, please. Sister Najah, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm ashamed. I have a question for you. It's a lot of coming with you. Do you find it difficult when I'm performing with you? The connection is really bad. Yes. Yeah, so sister, are you there still? Let's save the time. And okay. I think we've lost the, the, the connection there. Uh, please do. If you're going to call us, please try to call in a good connection. Um, that sister there, Najaf, Nigeria. The question that would have, but I didn't get that one, Sheikh. So I'll move on to the next question. Um, Brother Abdul, uh, Abdul Wafa, uh, no, Wafi, sorry. Um, he's speaking about uh, schools again, and I think he's carrying on from where we started off today's episode. Uh, international schools in a certain Muslim country. Uh, very lax in terms of the, the sisters or the teachers who are wearing the proper Islamic dress, uh, the students mingling, smoking afterwards, um, not much Quran and Hadith being taught. Now this is a general uh, picture of some of the international schools. Uh, there are things which are treatable. Okay. We can avoid such as, uh, I've mentioned before that Muslims have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. In our national schools you're paying a lot of money. You're paying in dollars. You're paying for the tuitions of your kids, so you get what you pay for. If you form parents' union and you have a representative, you will have the power of imposing whatever you want as long as it mm. is in line with the manhaj, with the curriculum of the school. Mm -hmm. And nobody would object to any good recommendations, which is not really uh, uh, very prejudiced or very extreme. So for instance, requiring to add some more Islamic studies it's upon your request, but if parents do not ask for it, if many parents I have mentioned before, I have met in the States, mm -hmm. some students who spent 23 years in Riyadh, they do not speak an Arabic word. And when I inquired about it, they said, well, we were sent to an international school. We spoke English. Our parents spoke to us English at home. The teachers spoke to us English at the school. The curriculums were in English. Very, very few words that they know in Arabic. I say then the blame is cast upon the parents. There are local schools for free in every Muslim society, but the parents would like to see their kids in, in the future graduates of Harvard, graduates of this and this school. So they send them to international schools so that they can join this university and that college and get a degree. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to achieve everything. It's very difficult to get every good in life. You have to compromise. I would like my kids to learn Arabic then I put them in bilingual school where they study both in Arabic and in English. I would like my kids to memorize the Quran. Unfortunately, there is no software where I can put my 
son's mind under some program and all of a sudden I download the Quran to his mind. It takes a process of a long period of time and effort. Without the help of both parents, it would not be achieved. And of course, one of the sisters who have talked to me, she's a revert. And mashallah, by the will of Allah and by His help, even though she's a revert, she managed to make her kids memorize several juz's of the Quran, some one third, some one half, and she was not an Arabic speaking person. So if you have a will, then there is a way. As far as smoking after the school, in international schools, private schools, there is a shuttle that picks up and delivers the, the, the students. So right away after, as long as they are on the board of the bus and in the school facility or premises, of course, there is no smoking. But if you give your son a car and if you give him plenty of money and you give him very little supervision, this is what you get. Once again, I'm not trying to say this is it. This, you have to accept it and you have just to say Alhamdulillah and be satisfied with that. No, it is a subject of change if you give it some attention and if you give it some emphasis. You go visit the school, you give them your opinion, you form a parent union and really there is no comparison between these minor things. It's not minor from an Islamic perspective but comparing to what you will get in a non-Muslim society, that is nothing. Okay, we have Brother Abu Hamza from the United Arab Emirates. Brother, you're live on Askara. Your question, please. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, Jazakallah for wonderful programming uh, you're presenting to us. Uh, I have a question regarding the Islamic banking and uh, uh, the product which is offered by many of the Islamic banking, which is called Murahaba. Murabaha. Like, uh, sorry? Murabaha. Murabaha, yeah. yeah. So I'd like uh, Sheikh uh, to uh, you know, give his opinion on this product. And uh, I'd like another advice about the Islamic uh, way of uh, entrepreneur. You know. So how we can go for Islamic uh, way of you know, uh, having a startup of a business. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Jazakallah khair, brother. Abu Hamza there from the United... Arab Emirates, okay, we have Brother Noor on the line from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live on Oscar. Your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm just, I want to know about the Fajr prayer. Okay, brother, could you just turn down your, your television set there, please? We could hear us very well. Yeah. <laughs> I think now it's okay. Yes, carry on, brother. Okay. Uh, because normally we used to have a kunut in the uh, fajr prayers. No. Mm -hmm. Is it is it mandatory or is it a sunnah? Okay. 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 Jazakallah khair, brother. This brother Noor there from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, if we can uh, quickly take Sister Wafas, because we've got a bit of a break going on. But just before that, she spoke about a, a particular hadith. I didn't get it. It was very, very quick. Did you get the hadith here? Uh, maybe due to the bad connection, uh, what I understood she was saying about that there is a hadith, and Allah knows best if this, what she meant, that everything has been condemned and criticized except right. enjoining what's right, mm -hmm. forbidding what's evil, and so on. And there is uh, a hadith that provides this meaning, الدُّنْيَا مَلْعُونَةٌ مَلْعُونٌ مَا فِيهَا إِلَّا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ um, uh, Disney has been cursed and, and whatever in it is likewise except the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything or anything that's similar to that. Uh, also enjoining what's right and forbidding what's evil. We said before that the Muslim can convert his entire life into a life of worship. This is very, very simple and accessible. Can convert his joy, delight, vacation and having fun into means of worship. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, every fun is prohibited except one who is disciplining his horse, uh, playing with his family and uh, shooting an arrow because these are means of fun. Meanwhile, it is for a productive and effective goal which is uh, educating your family, training your horse for a mean of uh, uh, proving yourself on a battlefield, anything that is similar to that. So when you learn how to drive a car, this is very important as well. Fly a plane, uh, go to the space, do any useful thing with a good intention. Study chemistry, study pharmacology, math. As long as you have a good intention behind it. For instance, I give you an example. Uh, many of the students in, um, uh, in the West, when you ask them, what would you like to be in the future? High school students. 
uh, one might say that a lawyer, he or she have never heard anything about law and what is the role of lawyers. But when you ask why, they say because they make a lot of money so that I could buy my S500 so I can buy a nice house. Same thing if he says I would like to be a physician for the same reason, a dentist, whatever. So these are not goals, these are sub-goals. But one who, uh, his mind, whose mind is oriented towards pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then his study, his eating, his drinking, his having an intimate affair with his spouse, he's going for a vacation for the summer, traveling here and there, with fulfilling the mandatory conditions set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all his entire life becomes a mean of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي Listen carefully. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my prayers, my nusik ceremonies, uh, mm -hmm. and my entire life and even my death. Lillahi rabbil alameen. So the Muslim can make his or her entire life a mean of worship. And it's not only limited to offering the five daily prayers, fasting during Ramadan, or just paying alms. I, I hope I understood your question properly and I, I give the right answer. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we're going to take a short break and uh, stick with us. Inshallah, we'll turn in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Choices, chances, dreams, and goals. Many mixed emotions in my heart and soul. For some, I made a plan. And did the best I can If God wills things can happen After all I'm just a man Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Let me just remind you of our telephone numbers. Country code is 202, then it's 855-248-249. And okay, we have Sister Sarah from the United Arab Emirates. Sister, you're live on Ask Huda. Your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair for all the work you are doing. Wa alaikum wa fiki. I wanted to ask a question about a wazifa uh, which uh, my mother was told to read. Mm -hmm. It is that uh, between the Fajr, Sunnah and Fard, she has to recite 11 times Durood Sharif and uh, 41 times Surah Fatiha, then 11 times Durood Sharif. This okay. is for her health. Yeah. Okay. Is this uh, correct according to the Sunnah? Okay. And my second question is about uh, wearing of socks for the ladies when they are praying. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask uh, what is this, okay. the ruling of this? Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, we have Sister Maryam from Nigeria. Sister, you're live on Ask Her Your Question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is, um, our father died and he left us a house, and the house we turned it into shops. And we used to collect the money annually, but not the same month. So is, I don't know whether we are uh, expected to pay the cut out of this shop. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Sister Mariam there from Nigeria. Question about Zakat. Okay, uh, Brother Abu Hamza from the United Arab Emirates uh, asked about Islamic banking and Murabaha. He asked if this type of it's a, it's a, a mortgage sort of system, is it allowed in Islam, Sheikh? 
Uh, I would like all the viewers to be very aware and educated about a very important fact, which is that العبرة بالمعاني لا بالألفاظ أو المسميات. What is really considered whenever we pass a judgment is the contents, the meaning of the name which you give, and whether it's really been practiced or not. But given just a name, المرابحة is an Islamic contract. Similarly, المضاربة is an Islamic contract. Where partners participate in both the gain and the loss. Okay? So if, they, if these are the contents of the contract, then it is permissible. Mm -hmm. But what I want to warn the viewers against is a situation that happened to me. An owner of uh, an Islamic bank in, in, in the States mm -hmm. came up to me and said, I would like you to propagate for our bank and whatever. I said, uh, you have to show me a sample of the contract. It's not enough to convince me that, Wallahi, I swear to God, mm -hmm. we're dealing in Islamic dealings mm -hmm. and we're good. That's not sufficient. Nowadays, I have to read between the lines before being able to pass a judgment. Similarly, one who's borrowing, one who's taking a loan, one who's investing in any bank in Islam, it's not sufficient to say, oh, Alhamdulillah, they say they're Islamic banking mm -hmm. or they're dealing with Islamic dealings. There is a contract that you sign. Read it beforehand. And if there is no violation, that's fine. But if there is anything that's confusing or you're not aware of its legality, then take it to uh, a trustworthy sheikh and discuss this with him before being able to pass a judgment. Jazakallah khair, sheikh. Okay, we have Sister Veronica on the line from Egypt. Sister, you're live. And ask her your question, please. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question regarding my aunt uh, because she said to me I need to go to the Philippines for one year. I, if I finish my contract, she said I go home to the Philippines so that I gonna finish my studies in nursing. Okay. And then she said to me and if I go to the Philippines, I can't practice anymore my Islam because Mostly of my family is uh, Christian. What I gonna do? Okay. Then I need for prayer for this situation. I hope you're gonna help me for this okay. question. Okay, Jazakallah, Sister Veronica from Egypt there. Jazakallah for that question, Sister. We'll get to it today, inshallah. Um, Sheikh, you just give some advice to Brother Abu Hamza about when you look into uh, these contracts. So what's the ideal way to have an Islamic kind of business to get a loan or to start it? He wants some advice on this, Sheikh. Uh, this is very wide subject to address mm -hmm. and to tackle. But for instance, if we're talking about Al-Murabaha, mm -hmm. this contract, if I invest in a bank where the bank actually takes the money and invests it in a project and you get a share of the profit, Meanwhile, if there is a loss, I'm subject of sharing the loss as well. Mm -hmm. It becomes lawful. But if my money will be taken and will be lent to somebody else with an interest rate, then they just give me lesser than this interest rate which they generated and they keep the difference for themselves. That's another form of riba. And basically, I am investing in riba indirectly. But I have to know that whether they are really making projects, building real estate, uh, contractions, uh, contracts, stuff like that, that's permissible. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they say that you have a fixed income, a fixed income percentage wise, they say, will give you more than anybody else 13% or 15%. That's definitely riba. That's definitely riba. 15% mm -hmm. of what? Of your capital sum. Mm -hmm. That's right away riba. When some other banks would really deceive their clients and they say, you know, they know that the regular banking, non-Muslim banks, they give 13%. So they give you 8%. Just because it is, sir, so some people would be under the impression that this is halal, which is not true. In another way, they're ripping them off, but mm -hmm. still investing in riba. But when they say that, you get that much rate of the profit that is permissible. When you say you invest with us $100,000, you get a percentage wise of the profit, not of your capital sum, then that becomes permissible. And does it have to be uh, something in there saying that if we do have losses, you do not get anything? Absolutely, because if they condition 
that becomes a fixed deposit, mm -hmm. even though it's invested, mm -hmm. but they don't, uh, uh, they, are, they are responsible totally for any loss, then that's riba. Because investment means I am a partner in both, gaining a loss. Somebody is going to say, well, but they never lose. In mm -hmm. fact, they do lose. But the problem or the fact is that because in, in banking, they are not only invested in one project. That's right. There are tens of thousands of projects. So if uh, 20, 30 or 40 of them lose, other projects are going to make up the difference. So in this case, that's permissible as well. Jazakallah khair, brother Sheikh, for that. That's very, very interesting and something to be wary about there. Uh, brother Nadim uh, from the Kim of Saudi Arabia. Brother, brother your life on Ask Kuri, a question, please. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum, salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, uh, my question is that uh, can you explain, uh, can you elaborate for this in, for the hijab according to the Quran and the Hadith? And what are the points for the females to wear a hijab? Okay. Jazakallah khair, Brother Nadim, they're from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, Sheikh, we've got a question here from Brother Noor from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia too uh, about the kanut in Fajr prayer. Um, is this mandatory or is it just something preferable, Sheikh? Al kanut, which is making supplication or invocation mm -hmm. after or upon rising up from Rukuwa, is a sunnah during calamities and afflictions. Mm -hmm. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when 70 of his companions were assassinated at Bi'ru Ma'una mm -hmm. by Ra'al wa Dhaqwan, two tribes, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up in prayer for a whole month in every single prayer of the five daily prayers in the last rak'ah upon rising from Rukuwa would make dua and ask Allah to uh, take revenge for them and punish the perpetrators. So if one were to make qunut, then it is in every single salah of the five daily prayers. But to specify a certain salah with qunut is not prescribed and it's not the tradition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I understand that it is a sunnah in the school of al-imam al-shafi'i. But remember what we said before. We all follow the school of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And al-imam al-shafi'i said, if the hadith is proven to be sound, then this is my madhab. Mm -hmm. So since we have a stronger reference that it is not right to limit the qunut to a specific salah, whether it's fajr or any other prayer, then the right way is to give up on qunut as long as there is no necessity. And if there is a need to make qunut, then it should be done in the five daily prayers. There is another thing had to be not here, which is, what if I'm a follower and I pray behind an imam who insists on making qunut in the fajr prayer? He says that I'm shafi'i and it is a must. You join the imam and make qunut because inna ma al imamu li bih. Al imam was appointed so that he would be followed and there is no blame, blame on you. Jazakallah khair shaykh. Okay, we've got a question uh, from Brother Jam Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, your question please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, actually, I try many times to get your number, but uh, I'm not able to get the number because number is coming only a small period of time. Okay. You must put the number always so we can get it. Jazakallah khair. Second thing, I have a question. I'm working in a construction company. Okay where we have some people they are listening music and these things i want you to listen a quran mm -hmm. while i am working when i am working on a computer i will put a quran cd and i can listen is it uh, any permissible is it possible that i can listen Toy. during working time okay thank you very much okay well, it's brother jam there from the kingdom of saudi arabia okay now we have sister zainab from qatar sister you're live and ask her your question please Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I have three questions. Okay. My first question is uh, regarding cutting one's nails. What is the rule regarding uh, uh, cutting one's nails, that is when one is in a state of major impurity? Is it permissible? Sorry. Also, is it permissible to cut one's nails after dusk? Okay. Hello, okay. My second question is, uh, I have frequent migraine. And uh, usually when I have uh, headaches, I uh, perform my salah by sitting. Okay. Is this uh, permissible? And uh, when, when uh, my headache recedes, when I'm in a better condition, I still continue uh, performing my salah sitting uh, because when, when I go uh, to sujood, uh, my headache increases again. So only when I'm perfectly uh, all right, I continue uh, to perform salah while uh, standing. 
Okay. Is this uh, is this okay? Okay. My third question is, um, uh, I know that uh, a bath is uh, compulsory when you have a sexual intercourse with your husband, but uh, uh, when uh, when we don't uh, go till the sexual intercourse, uh, to what extent can we go? Okay. When uh, the, the, when the, when the bath is uh, necessary. Okay. I hope I'm clear. Yes, you are, sister. Thank you very much. Okay, Sister Zainab there from Qatar. Okay, Sheikh. Um, Sister Sarah from the United Arab Emirates asked a question, a wazifa. She's speaking about certain um, dua to do, certain things to recite. She said her mother who's ill has been told between the Fajr, uh, uh, Sunnah and the, the Wajib to recite certain types of things. 11 times the Sharif and 41 times Fatiha and so forth. Is this something from the Sunnah, Sheikh? I find it very important to um, address this issue with more details. Okay, sure. Why? Mm -hmm. Because right before the show, somebody brought to me a book and said, what do you think of this book? It is a book of azkar and remembrance and as salah wa taslim upon the Prophet sallallahu etc. I looked at it. It contains both prescribed supplications and invocations and others have been made up by individuals attributed to such and such sheikh and peer and mullah etc. So I told that person, take this book away and do not use it. And I explained to him that it contains both this way and that way. It is very difficult to explain to an ordinary person who opens a book and says, it is a book of wazifa and it's all about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, do not read in this book. The big question will be, why? Why shouldn't I read in it? It all contains good recitations, verses and a hadith. Yes, it contains some of this and some of made up supplications, even some ahadith or ways of remembrance that's attached to a certain number. Now it becomes restricted. What is the reference to that? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, who is the main inspirer of Al Imam Abu Hanifa, by the way, mm -hmm. once entered the masjid and he notes that some of Al Tabi'een were sitting and they were making dhikr. One of them, their leader, was saying, Say Subhanallah a thousand times. Then upon finishing, they count on pebbles, say Alhamdulillah that many times, and so on. He stood next to them and said, What are you doing? They said, Ya Abu Abdul Rahman, we're making dhikr. We're just saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, what's wrong with that? That is the question which every time you say to somebody, don't do that, will say, what's wrong with making dhikr? Mm -hmm. Not only that, their shiyukh as well, their leaders say, they're asking you not to make dhikr. That's not true, brothers and sisters. We're asking you to make dhikr day and night, but the dhikr which the Nabi sallallahu have prescribed for us. I mean, if you just stick to what he prescribed, you would occupy your entire day making dhikr and inquire a peace of mind and a comfort for your eyes. So he said to them, by Allah, it seemed like you guys have a better guidance than what the Prophet sallallahu wasallam had. Do you receive revelations? Do you know that this set is better than what the Prophet sallallahu wasallam prescribed? Then they brought up the second objection, which we also face whenever somebody is telling us this, which is, Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, we only intend to do a good thing. That is a good thing. So he said to them, Given a parable that how many people aim good, intend to do good, but they could not achieve it. So number one, it's not true that just because your intention is good, you would achieve the reward for that. Unless if you fulfill two conditions. One, intention, which is referring to sincerity. Second, compliance. It's got to be in, 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 in accordance with the Quran or with the teachings of an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said that her mother recites 11 times the Surah and 33 times the Dua and so on. There is nowhere in the Quran or in the Sunnah this prescription for her health. But you may recite any Dua or any supplication without limiting this to a number as long as you're doing it by the way. But to set it as it's got to be recited in this number, you have to have a reference to it. And if you don't, then you're making your own deen. While the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, follow and do not innovate. Whosoever innovates anything in the religion of Allah, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it will be rejected. There comes the biggest threat. 
that means I would not receive a reward for this wadifa? No, you will not receive a reward for it because you are making your own ibadah and worship is got to be fulfilled according to Allah's will, according to His wish, according to His prescription, not according to your own desire, not even according to Sheikh Muhammad's desire. Okay, the second question from the sister uh, was about wearing socks for Salah for the ladies. Uh, do they have to cover their feet for Salah, Sheikh? There are two schools in that regard, and the best opinion is to cover the socks according to Hadith on Musalama. May Allah be pleased with her. When she asked the Prophet, وسلم, he said, If the woman is wearing the garment that's long enough to cover the feet, then it is permissible. So we advise her to keep her uh, feet covered. But if she's wearing the longer garment that's covering, then wearing the socks is not required then. Okay, Jazakallah Khashak. Okay, Sister Miriam from Nigeria asked about her, uh, her late father, may Allah have mercy on him. He left a house for them. Um, they converted this into a shop and were taking earnings from this. Um, this earnings, are they zakatable? That's what she wants to know, Sheikh. La, as long as it is not uh, an object which is a subject for trade or sale. But, uh, the shop is been used, maybe you're renting the shop, maybe you're utilizing the shop itself. If you're renting the shop, then the rent by the end of the year will be gathered and you see how much is it if it exceeds the nisab by itself or by adding this to your wealth as well, then it becomes zakatable. But the value of the shop or the house itself is not zakatable. Okay, Jazakallah Khashik. Okay, Sister Veronica. Uh, from Egypt, uh, asked a, a question about returning to her home country. No. Uh, she's a revert to Islam. Uh, she says, if I return to my own country for whatever reason, I'm going to have problems because my family are not Muslim and it's going to be very difficult for me. And I know Sister Veronica did ring us quite a few times. So what kind of advice can we give the sister on this, Sheikh? One, if the sister, alhamdulillah, since I'm aware of the story for Islam, she accepted Islam by calling us, may Allah keep her strong mm -hmm. and increase her faith I mean. and so on. If she believes that now she is in a level where she can keep her Iman and give her da'wah to her family members and so on, and her family are not going to affect her or make her change her mind by any means, in this condition she may go and join them. But if she feels she will be under the risk of maybe giving up on her faith, being weak and so on, then she must not go. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, that's uh, all the time we have for today. We've run out of time. We've got so many questions still waiting. Uh, for all those people who have sent emails, please bear with us. We're going to do a few extra programs just to go through all of your emails so they won't be lost. Um, until next time, we've got to leave you this time with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as-salam. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh.